Hey everybody, welcome to Chapter 5. Um, hopefully Chapter 5 will be a little bit easier than Chapters 3 and 4, at least in volume of work. Uh, we'll see though. I think uh, it's interesting how uh, one person might find Chapters 3 and 4 pretty easy and, and uh, another might find them very hard and vice versa with, with Chapter 5 and, and moving forward. So I guess I'll just jump right into it. Um, chapter 5 is about merchandising operations. So to this point, the businesses we've looked at have been uh, service-based businesses, businesses who sell a service to somebody. Um, a doctor's office would be a service-based business. You don't go to the doctor's office and buy merchandise. You buy uh, medical care. A merchandiser is a business that sells inventory, sells stuff to people. Um, and then the other thing they're going to introduce here is what's called the multiple step income statement, which uh, won't be a big stretch since you're already beginning to feel comfortable with the income statement. There's the learning objectives for the chapter. Take a look at them. And then there's the preview, how they break down, how you'll learn about those various uh, learning objectives. All right. So as I mentioned, merchandising companies buy and sell goods. That's what they do. Uh, there's wholesalers. Wholesalers usually supply those goods to retailers. Retailers supply those goods to consumers, you and me and everyone else who buys stuff. Uh, instead of just calling it service revenue, they typically call their revenue sales revenue, or sometimes they just call it sales, but that's the money that they earn by selling stuff to people. Okay. So something that we didn't have on the income statement of a service-based company is a line item called cost of goods sold. Uh, if you think about it, the cost of goods sold name says exactly what it is. It's the cost of the goods that are sold. So uh, if I'm a Walmart and I sell a can of green beans to somebody for a dollar, I probably didn't pay a dollar for that can of green beans. I probably paid something like 70 cents. Um, so if I were to sell you that can of green beans, my cost of goods sold would be 70 cents. So if we take the revenue, the dollar we made from selling the can, minus the cost, 70 cents, that would equal our gross profit. Or another way of saying gross profit would be the profit before other expenses, or the profit after only the cost of goods sold has been subtracted out. So that's gross profit. That's the thing that we didn't see before on our uh, service-based business income statements, but we will see on the merchandising income statements. And then we take out operating expenses. Those are the expenses of operating the business, and we're left with net income. All right, so we knew the operating cycle of a service company was to start with cash, perform services. Then we would have an accounts receivable, meaning the customer would owe us if they didn't pay cash. Then we would receive the cash, and we'd be back to cash again. That's the operating cycle. With a the merchandiser, there's another step. We take our cash and we buy inventory. The inventory sits there on the shelves at our business. Then people purchase the inventory, which creates an account receivable if they don't pay cash. Then we collect that account receivable, and we have the cash again. So that extra step of having inventory uh, is an important one for merchandising operations. As you can imagine, it's very important in the sense that if you buy inventory and you can't sell it, then you've already spent the cash, but you don't have really anything other than inventory you can't sell. So it's important to be able to sell it and sell it in a timely manner. So here's the flow of our costs. We have beginning inventory. This is just at the beginning of a period, beginning of a month. We could count it up and say, this is how much inventory I have sitting on my shelves right now. And then during the period, we would purchase other goods. So the cost of goods purchased plus the beginning inventory adds up to be our cost of goods available for sale. That's stuff that we have on hand that we can sell to people. Then at the end of the month, we could measure how much we sold by adding up our inventory that's left over and subtracting that from the cost of goods available for sale and that would tell us the cost of goods sold. So beginning inventory 
plus cost of goods purchased equal cost of goods available for sale, and cost of goods sold plus ending inventory will also equal the cost of goods available for sale. And you'll see how that plays out in a minute here. Companies can use either what's called a perpetual inventory system or a periodic inventory system. In a perpetual system, what that means is the company knows at all times how much inventory they have. This used to really only be used for companies that had a relatively small amount of inventory and that inventory was relatively high dollar. A good example might be a car dealership. A car dealership could tell you exactly how many cars they have on the lot. They could tell you what they paid for each car. So at any moment they could tell you the value of all of their inventory sitting there. Then when they sell a vehicle, they subtract the cost of that vehicle from their inventory and they claim the revenue for selling it. Now it's not just companies that have you know, a relatively small number of expensive items. With barcode scanners, many companies that even have thousands and thousands of little products track their inventory on a perpetual basis. So the records continuously update each time they sell something. As you can imagine, in the old days, that would have been very hard to do. Every time I sell a can of green beans, I've got to go in there and subtract off, uh, you know, 70 cents or whatever. That, that would have been very difficult to do. But with barcode scanners, it makes it much, much easier. So many, many more companies use a perpetual system now than what they used to. In a periodic system, you don't keep detailed records of the goods on hand. Instead, you determine your cost of goods sold by, by counting up an inventory count. In essence, here's the basic calculation. You start with your beginning inventory. You add your purchases. That gives you your cost of goods available for sale. You subtract your ending inventory, which is actually found by a physical count of the inventory sitting on the shelves and the difference between your goods available for sale and your ending inventory is your cost of goods sold. When I was a kid, my mother owned a store and I can remember having to go with a notepad um, and look at each individual item in the store. So there were cans of green beans. I would have to count them and then write down 12 cans of green beans on the notebook and then move on to the cans of corn and the cans of peas, etc. As you can imagine, it was quite a project for us each year to count up our inventory, but we had to to figure out our cost of goods sold because we didn't have barcode scanners and so we used a periodic system, meaning we calculated our cost of goods sold each period as opposed to a perpetual system, meaning we constantly keep the system updated. All right. So the advantages of the perpetual system and why most businesses are trying to move toward it um, is that it shows you the quantity and cost of inventory that should be on hand at any time and provides better control over your inventory. You're not sitting there for the whole year with no idea exactly how much inventory you have. You always have a pretty good guess. Um, that being said, even in a perpetual system, they occasionally have to do a hand count uh, of the goods because goods get stolen or they get broken or other things happen to the goods that uh, that would keep them from getting registered as sold in the system but they're not there. So if you ever walk into a Walmart and you see an associate in their blue vest and they're, uh, they're looking at a shelf and they're counting the number of items on the shelf and then have a little handheld barcode scanner, what they're doing is punching in the quantity on the shelf and then scanning the barcode and telling the system, hey system, there are 23 of these items on hand. Then the system will check it against the inventory records and will make an adjustment. If there's supposed to be 25 but there's only 23, they'll adjust that as shrinkage or as a loss of, of products probably through theft or spoilage. Anyway, so hopefully that makes it a little bit clearer. All right, so here's what we do when we're going to record a purchase. This is assuming a perpetual inventory system. So when we deal with our supplier, the person who sells the goods to us that we are going to resell to our customers, we record the purchase when we receive the goods from the seller. Usually you receive what's called a purchase invoice. That would be the source documentation for this transaction. All right, so here's Sox Stereo. They purchase... Um, 
it looks like they purchased some merchandise from PW Audio Supply Inc. You can take a look at that right there. So now we're supposed to make the journal entry. So our inventory account will increase by 3800 That's our cost. And our accounts payable will increase by 3800 There's a couple of issues we have to deal with when we're making these purchase records, okay, when we're recording the purchase of goods in our books. The first is the freight costs and the terms of sale. We need to understand if we're paying for the freight or if the seller is paying for the freight. Okay, So what's it, they'll use these terms FOB shipping point and FOB destination. FOB stands for freight on board. With FOB shipping point, that means that the ownership of the, of the inventory passes from the seller to the buyer when the seller hands the box over to the public carrier. Let's assume it's UPS or FedEx or somebody. So when that seller slaps a label on it and gives it to the delivery company, at that point we're assuming the ownership passes to the buyer and the buyer pays for the freight costs or the cost of getting it from the seller to the buyer. Under FOB destination, now we're assuming the seller maintains ownership of the property, of the inventory, all the way until it gets to the buyer. In that case, the seller pays the freight cost. If you're in a real business scenario and you're purchasing something that's going to have to be shipped to you, it's important to understand if this is FOB uh, shipping point or FOB destination. In other words, am I, the buyer, paying for the freight or is the seller paying for the freight? That's an important distinction. All right. So assume upon delivery of the goods on May 6, Sox Stereo pays the public freight company $150 for freight charges. What we do is we don't charge that as an expense to the period. Instead, we include it as part of our inventory cost. So the cost of purchasing the merchandise we're going to sell and any cost of getting it to us and getting it ready to sell is all wrapped into the inventory cost. So our, we'll increase inventory by 150 and decrease our cash by 150. Remember, inventory is an asset account. If we buy it the other way, where it's FOB uh, destination, then that means that the seller, PW Audio Supply, pays the freight charges. So PW Audio Supply would have to enter a journal entry of, of freight costs, $150, and cash of $150. So it matters who's paying for it because that's whose books it gets recorded in. Another issue we have to deal with when trying to figure out the cost of merchandise is what's called purchase returns and allowances. Uh, sometimes the purchaser um, will be able to return the things they're buying from their, sell, from their supplier for a, a refund, okay? And they'll either do a credit refund or a cash refund if they paid for it in cash, right? So you buy something, it costs you $500, you get it, you don't like it, you send it back and they give you your $500 back. That's a purchase return. Sometimes they'll do what's called a purchase allowance. Like let's say uh, we order some shrimp from a seafood supplier and uh, it gets to us and it's partially spoiled, but still partially usable. We can call the supplier and say, hey, look, this is partially spoiled. We want to return it. And the supplier might say, why don't you keep it and we'll give you a half off discount or an allowance, they call it. Then we don't send the shrimp back. They just give us an allowance or they reduce the amount we owe them, reduce the accounts payable. So that's the difference between a purchase return and a purchase allowance. So here's an here's a illustration. Assume Sox Stereo returned goods costing $300 to PW Audio Supply. So the journal entry they would enter is that their accounts payable would decrease by $300. That's $300 less that they have to pay to uh, PW Audio Supply, and their inventory would be decreased by 300 because they sent back $300 worth of stuff. All right. There's also purchase discounts. Oftentimes, a supplier will offer a discount to 
the purchaser if they'll pay their bill early. Why? Well, because they want to encourage people to pay their bills. And so they're willing to take a little less money if they can get the cash more quickly. So this is, you see over where it says example, this is how these purchase discounts are written, or credit terms are written. So you need to understand what these mean. It says example credit terms may read 2 slash 10 comma n slash 30. That means a 2% discount if paid within 10 days, or net, meaning the full amount, is due within 30 days. That's an example of how these things are written. So this gives the buyer the option of taking a 2% discount if they want to pay early within 10 days, or they have up to 30 days to pay the full amount. Why do they do this? Because the purchaser can save money and the seller can shorten their operating cycle by getting the cash quicker. Here's other examples. So there's 210 net 30, which we just looked at. You'll also see things like 110 net 30 or 310 net 30. Um, just remember that the first number is the percentage discount, then the slash, then the second is the number of days that the person has to take the discount. 1 slash 10 EOM means a 1% discount if paid within um, the first 10 days of the next month. And net 10 EOM means net amount due within 10 days of the next month. Here's an example. Sox Stereo pays a beginning balance or uh, pays a balance due of $3,500 on May 14th, the last day of the discount period. So prepare the journal entry Sox Stereo makes on May 14th to record the payment. So here they've got to make a payment that shows they're paying the whole amount because their accounts payable at this point is $3,500. But they're not going to pay it all in cash. So accounts payable will go down or be debited $3,500. Inventory will, um, remember this inventory is a, is a asset account. So we're going to actually be decreasing our inventory account because when we bought the stuff originally, we increased our inventory account by 3500 But we're, we're not going to be having to pay all that. Remember, inventory is listed at our cost. And then our cash is decreased by 3430 so that's what happens when we get a discount, is it reduces the, the cost of the inventory by the amount. And so that discount was 2% of $3,500 or $70. Here's an example if they fail to take the discount, so the same transaction. Now they just have to pay it in cash. All right. So then the other question is, is it really worth it to take those discounts? And here's a way you can figure it out. You can say, look, if I take a 2% discount on $35 to $100, that's $70. If I were to take the same $3,500 and earn 10% on it, investing it in the stock market or something, uh, for, for the same 20 days, because that's how much time I'm getting, right? It's a, 10, a discount for if I pay within 10 days, but if I were to pay within 30, then I, I, can, I don't have the discount. So for, I get those extra 20 days, 10%, 3,500 for 20 days is 1918. I'm actually still coming out way ahead. I'm making way better than 10%. So in that case, it really makes sense for me as the buyer to take advantage of that discount. The summary of the purchasing transactions for this whole example. So on the fourth, they purchased it for thirty-eight hundred. Then on the eighth, they had a return of three hundred. This is what's happening in the inventory account. So when they purchased, the inventory account increased or was debited by thirty-eight hundred. When they had a return, the inventory account decreased or was credited three hundred. On the sixth, they paid for the freight charges of one hundred and fifty dollars. So that increased the cost of their inventory. And on the 14th, they took advantage of the $70 discount, which decreased the cost of the inventory. In the end, they have $3580 as a debit balance in their inventory account. And that makes sense because inventory is an asset, and that would be on the normal side. All right, so now that we have merchandise sitting there at our business, we need to sell it to customers. That's what we're doing. We're trying to make a profit by selling it for more than we paid for it. So again, we usually record 
the sale of merchandise on a sales invoice or on a sales receipt. And that's our supporting documentation. So anytime we make a sale of merchandise or a sale of goods, whatever you want, what term you want to use, instead of just a two-part journal entry, we have a four-part journal entry, or there's like two entries. Because at one, we have to show the money we're making by selling the goods uh, at the sales price. And the two, we have to show that the goods are leaving us at their cost. Okay? So if you think about it, if the whole point of a merchandising business is to buy inventory, mark it up, and then sell it at a profit, we have to recognize the fact that there's a difference in the cost and in the sales price. So that's why there's four entries here. The first entry is going to show the cash or accounts receivable, depending on how we sold it, and the sales revenue. So if I sold something for $500 uh, for cash, my cash would go up by $500 and my sales revenue would go up by $500. If I sold it for on account, meaning someone could pay me down the road, then my accounts receivable would go up by 500 and my sales revenue would go up by 500. Now if that item I sold for $500 cost me $300, then I would have to show that I no longer have that $300 in inventory. Why? Because I've taken it out of inventory and giving it, given it to the customer. So my cost of goods sold, which is an expense account, goes up by 300 and my inventory, which is an asset, goes down by 300. Now if you think about it, if I have the revenue, 500, minus the cost of goods sold of 300, there's where my gross profit comes in. I made $200 on the transaction. Here's P&W Audio Supply. They record the sale of $3,800 on May 4th to Sox Stereo on account. Soon the merchandise costs $2,400. So they're going to show accounts receivable, $3,800, and sales revenue of $3,800. Then they have to show that the cost of the, that their merchandise is no longer in their inventory. So they're going to have the cost of goods sold, which is an expense account, of $2,400, and the inventory decreasing by $2,400. That's how you record the sale of merchandise. Sales returns and allowances. We already looked at the, the idea of purchase returns and allowances, sales returns and allowance. This says are the flip side of the purchase returns and allowance. Um, so here's the thing. When we sell something to a customer and then they return it to us, we don't want to just undo the sale. We want to show that we had the sale, but then it was returned so that we always have that in our records. It would distort things if we just... Uh, backed it out, so to speak, and, and got rid of the sale. So instead what we do is we use a returns and allowance account. So here's an example. Prepare an entry PW Audio would make to record the credit for return goods that had a $300 selling price. Assume my $140 cost. Assume the goods were not defective. So it just meant that the purchaser didn't like them or whatever. So we would show a sales return allowance of $300 and our accounts receivable going down by 300. We would also show our inventory increasing now by 140 because we're putting those goods back into inventory and the cost of goods sold decreasing by 140. Now this is similar but a little different. Assume the return goods were defective and had a scrap value of $50. P&W Audio would make the following entries. So you have the sales returns and allowance still of 300 and accounts receivable of 300. But now the inventory would only increase by 50, okay? Because we're not getting full value back from what we sold. And our cost of goods sold would decrease by 50. All of these ideas, the revenue, the returns and allowances, and the discounts from the sales side add up to give us what's called net sales. You can see that sales returns and allowances and sales discounts are both contra revenue accounts. Those are revenue accounts that have normal balances on the debit side rather than the credit side. So we'll add up sales revenue on the credit side 
and then we'll subtract the sales returns and allowance and the sales discounts to be left with net sales or the amount of sales uh, that are our actual sales for the period. So again, here's another example. They pay the balance due of $3,500. The gross invoice price was $3,800 less the purchase returns and allowances of $300. On May 14th, the last day of the discount period, let's see, oh, they paid on the last day. Prepare a journal entry. So this is really just the entry we did earlier um, from the purchase, from the perspective of Sox Stereo when they purchased it. Now this is the journal entry that PNW Audio would put in. So they would show accounts receivable would go down, right? They're no longer owed that 3500 The sales discount would be debited, $70, and the cash would increase by 3430 So the customer paid them $3,430 in cash, but they reduced their accounts receivable by 3500 The difference is the sales discount, $70. All right, so let's look at the income statement. To this point, we've used what's called a single step income statement. It has the revenue and it has the expenses. You subtract the expenses from the revenue and you get net income. Single step income statement's great because it's easy uh, and, and it really kind of simply lays out how the company is doing. So there's your example of the single step income statement you've looked at. But often, businesses use something called a multi-step income statement. And the multi-step income statement uh, has a few more items that are important. Uh, the first is what's called gross profit, which I explained to you earlier is the difference between the revenue and the cost of goods sold. Then there's income from operations. This separates out the expenses into two more groups. The operating expenses, or those costs of running the business day to day, and the non-operating, or the, they're kind of like exceptional or unusual revenue and expenses. Uh, and then finally you have net income, which you had on the, the old single step that you knew. So here's an example of a multi-step income statement. You can see the net sales minus the cost of goods sold gives us the gross profit minus the operating expenses gives us something called income from operations and then minus other revenues and other expenses. Again, those are the unusual ones that aren't part of the normal operation of the business. And that gives them the net income. Net sales is the sales minus any sales returns and allowances and discounts. Gross profit we've already established is the net sales minus the cost of goods sold. Operating expenses are those costs of operating the business day to day. Non-operating activities are those expenses which are not normal as part of the operations of the business. A good example it has right there is gain on the disposal of the plant assets. So if they sold off some equipment or something like that, that would be and made a gain on it, that would be a revenue, but it's not a normal revenue that they're going to make every month. It's a special for this month. There's some examples of other revenues, other expenses, and then finally net income. So I spent a lot of time telling you about how we figure out the cost of goods sold uh, when we're using a perpetual system. Under a periodic system, it actually would seem simpler because we just mathematically calculate the cost of goods sold. But in real life, no, it's not simpler because in order to do that, you've got to count up the inventory by hand and figure out how much inventory is there. So in a periodic system, that's why it's not, it's used less and less. But just so you know, the way you do it is uh, you simply figure out your cost of goods purchased, which is taking the, the beginning inventory, adding any purchases, subtracting out any purchase allowances or discounts, and that gives you the cost of goods purchased. When you add the cost of goods sold, I'm sorry, when you add the, the inventory at the beginning of the period plus any goods purchased, that gives you the cost of goods available for sale, right? What I had on hand plus anything that I purchased during the period is the amount that's available to sell. Then if I count up the inventory and subtract that from the cost of goods available for sale, 
That tells me the cost of goods sold during the period. Think about it this way. If I know how much I started with, and I know how much I added during the period, that tells me how much I have available, or had available during the period. Then, if I count it up and see how much is sitting there at the end of the period, if I subtract that out, that'll tell me how much I actually sold during the period. That's the cost of goods sold and how we calculate it in a periodic system. All right, a couple of ways to evaluate profitability. The first is what's called the gross profit rate. It's simple, you just take your gross profit, divide it by your net sales, and that expresses the gross profit as a percentage of sales. There's the formula, here's an example using REI to exporting goods in the industry average. So you can see that REI has a much higher cost of goods sold, um, I'm sorry, a much higher gross profit percentage um, than Dick Sporting Goods or the industry average. So somehow they're keeping their cost of goods sold low, and that gives them a higher gross profit margin or gross profit rate. Profit margin ratio is similar, except we take the net income and divide that by the uh, sales or net sales. Here we can see that REI actually has a lower net profit margin, or they just call it profit margin ratio, than the exporting goods or the industry average. So that's curious, right? They must have higher operating expenses even though their cost of goods sold are lower. Uh, last thing is the idea of what's called quality of earnings ratio. Sometimes it's hard to tell how much of a company's profits are really good and how much of their profits are due to the way that they do their accounting. Uh, we've already talked about how um, if we're a little more aggressive on our depreciation schedules or anything we use that are assumptions that are going to create expenses, that can impact what our net income looks like. So the idea is this measures the net cash provided by operating activities divided by net income. A totally cash-based business where they didn't, you know, where everything was sold for cash and bought with cash and never used accounts receivable or payable would have a quality of earnings ratio of one, where the net income would exactly equal the net cash provided by operating activities. So the more we, uh, the more we use aggressive accounting techniques, the more we would expect the cash provided by operating activities to be lower than the net income, which would give us a quality of earnings ratio of less than one. Conversely, uh, the more, the, the less we use those things, the higher that net cash relative to the net income will be. And so that would give us a higher quality of earnings ratio, which would mean that number means but they're being very uh, conservative in their accounting approach. And that's it for the chapter. I suggest um, that you read through it. Just make sure you understand the concepts and uh, the work shouldn't be too hard for you. If you have any questions, of course, let me know and I will do my best to answer them.